Hello, I'm just struggling with my uh, in-ear monitor, which is sitting on my stomach. Today's guest is interesting. Now, here's someone that I knew and she was doing well. And then she went to America and she's done really well. And I can't wait to catch up with her. Ladies and gentlemen, Gina Yashere. There she is. Good morning. Well, it's morning for me. It, then it is morning for all of us because <laughs> you, you are the reason we're here. How are you? I'm good, Rob. How are you? Long time no see. So how long? I think it's got to be 15 years, something like More that. More than that. I left, I moved to the States 14 years ago and I'm sure I hadn't seen you for a good couple of years before that. Wow. wow. Yeah, man. Well, it's really nice. It's really nice to see you. <laughs> for us, this is going to be a, a big catch up. I followed your story from afar it would it would come up and I say oh see Gina's doing this and Gina's doing that oh look at this and look at that <laughs> but you talk about somebody who was doing well here and you went off to America yeah. and I said in my introduction she was doing well here now she's doing really well <laughs> it's a great story tell us it well, basically, you know, I was doing well here, earning a great living, doing stand-up. You know, I was making lots of guest appearances on TV shows in the UK. But I was always, oh, yeah, I've seen that go on lots of things. What's her name again? But I was doing pretty well. I am doing the guest appearances, selling out small theatres on my live shows. I was doing well. But it wasn't enough because I just felt like there was more that I could achieve and the opportunities just weren't there for me in England as a black comedian. Uh, I've been saying this for years, that the British uh, industry has a nightclub policy when it comes to black comics. Yeah, yeah. It's one, out, one in, one out. Yeah. And Lenny yeah. Henry was in, so we were all basically sitting back waiting for him to die. And you were he, waiting till he'd had enough time in that club. He danced. <laughs> he didn't want to dance anymore. Yeah. He was looking for the door. Yeah. And then one of us would slip in as he came out. But he weren't going anywhere. So... You know, I just felt like um, we were all put in one box. So yeah. I was like, well, I can either stay here and just keep being the girl on Talking Heads and the odd, the, the, the token booking on Mock the Week, or I can go out to America and swim with the sharks. Now, I've always wanted to live in America since I was a kid. So when the opportunity came, I jumped at it, grabbed it with both hands, and off I went. It's a huge leap. In, into the unknown. This is always my view on it is uh, it, it's taken me so long to get to where I am here that the thought of going somewhere else and, and starting again, as it were, terrifies me. It was exciting for me. Mm -hmm. The world is a very small place. So my thing was I can go to America and I know I'm going to be starting from scratch there because nobody knows who I am. But if I run out of money, it's a quick flight back to London, do some shows around the country, get my money and go back to America. So that's what I was doing for the first seven years I was in America. I was literally earning no money while I just established myself. What footholds then were you making in Los Angeles during that time? You must have been doing something while you were there. What were the first things that happened for you? Uh, I got onto Deaf Comedy Jam, the iconic uh, urban stand-up comedy show. I got on that within six months of landing in Los Angeles. So basically, I was just going to all the comedy clubs and going, can I get booked? Will you pay me? And uh, in America, in Los Angeles specifically, comedy clubs do not pay a lot of money because they're like, we're in LA. You could be seen by Steven Spielberg. So by letting you perform on our stages, really, we're doing you a favour. So yeah. at the time when I moved over there in 2007, the comedy clubs weren't paying a lot of money. You could do a 10-minute set and they'd give you a cheque for $8.75. It was that bad. Are you now? Hang on a minute. Are you serious? Are that little money? Oh yeah. If you I got mean, that's 20, virtually nothing. Yeah. If you got twenty dollars after a ten minute set, you were like, oh, I've done well tonight. So it was it was a long hard struggle. What I would do is just sit in comedy clubs, just waiting. And if I heard the the comedy club manager go, oh, so and so's running late. They're not going to be here on time for their set. I'd be like, oh well, I'm here. I can go up and do five minutes until they come. And that is basically how I worked my way into the comedy clubs uh, in, in Los Angeles. And that's how I got Deaf Comedy Jam. I was at uh, the comedy store late one, one night and uh, all these comedians were going up and doing sets. 
and uh, Damon Wayans' son, Damon Wayans Jr., went on stage and absolutely crushed the room. And the other comics did, who were supposed to go after him did not want to follow him. Uh, unbeknownst to me, they were doing a showcase for the bookers for Deaf Comedy Jam. I was just there watching the show and hoping to get up. And so when the next comic who was supposed to go on after uh, uh, Damon Wayans Jr. didn't want to go up because he didn't want to look bad in comparison to Damon, I was like, well, I'll go up and do five minutes if you need someone to fill some time. So they're like, all right, go up and do five minutes. It's your funeral. I went up. <laughs> <laughs> I did my thing. And two days later, I got a call from the bookers for Deaf Comedy Jam saying, we saw you. We'd love to book you for the show. So that's how a lot of my early opportunities came about, just being ready, staying ready, and just being around and, try, and jumping on opportunities as, as they arise. And did that then signal the end of those gigs? Did you then move to another level in America? Nope. <laughs> 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 After I did Dev Comedy Jam, I was like, oh, well, I'm on my way now. This is a massive TV show. Surely this is now the the elusive TV credits that you need to get. With all the streaming and all the million networks out there, it's a lot harder and takes a lot longer to get seen. It really does, doesn't it? I think I always say it's, it's, it's easier to get on telly, but it's harder for anyone to notice. Yeah, yeah. So now, so, so, so tell me now, so Bob Hart's Abishola, yes. right? It's a hit show. It's yes. on CBS. Yes. You're a huge part of it. Yeah. Tell us how that happened. Here's what happened. So I get a call out of the blue from my agent. Now, at this point, I'm living in New York. I've left Los Angeles. I'm not making any money in LA. So I've moved to New York. I've been living there six years at this point, five years at this point. Living in New York, uh, I met the woman um, uh, who's the love of my life. We're living together. We're having a wonderful life in New York. I'm working at weekends. I'm traveling around America at this point. I'm doing well. I get a call out of the blue from my agent. Can you fly to Los Angeles on Sunday? Uh, because Chuck Lorre wants to meet you. And I'm like, Chuck Lorre, who is, who? Mm, I've heard the name, I think I've heard the name. I'm not quite sure who that is. And my agent is like, oh my God, put the phone down, Google him, call me back. <laughs> so I uh, Google him and I come back to my agent and I go, holy shit, oh yeah, okay. Chuck Lorre of Big Bang Theory, Two and a Half Men, Mike and Molly, Kaminsky, you know, all of those shows. So I'm like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, got it, yeah. So what does he want? And my agent is like, I don't know, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> they just want to meet you, go to LA. If you have to cycle there and start, start riding now, you're going to LA to meet Chuck Lorre. So I'm like, fine, okay, I'll fly over there. But I've just come off a massive tour. I was in Montreal for a month. I promised my missus that I'm not traveling anywhere for the next three weeks. So if you're going to make me travel to LA to meet this man, they could at least fly me first class. Are they flying me first class? My agent goes, ugh, puts the phone down, calls me back. He goes, no, they're not flying me first class because, you know, it's just a meeting and they don't generally fly people first class for a meeting. And I was like, well, then I'm not going. Oh, no. No, no. Uh, you told me to Google Chuck Lorre and Warner Brothers. I did. They have more money than the Catholic Church. So they can afford to fly, fly me first class. So my agent is like, oh my God. He puts the phone down, calls me back 45 minutes later and goes, all right, they're flying you first class. And I'm like, damn right. Know your worth, people. If this guy wants to meet me that badly, he's going to want to meet me. He's not going to let the difference between a, a, a coach flight and first class stop that happening so yeah 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 but hang on a minute because you say if this guy wants to meet me that badly you don't know that he does want to meet you that badly for all you know they wanted to meet someone else that person was unavailable maybe you're third or fourth on the list that's maybe. a hell of a lot of self-belief gina maybe but there's no other me's out there as far as i know <laughs> so <laughs> they fly me out first class to this meeting put me up in a very nice hotel I walk into a room, it's Chuck Lorre, it's Eddie Gorodetsky, it's Al Higgins, who are his uh, exec producers that he works with on the majority of his, his shows. And Chuck says, you're probably wondering why you're here. And in my head, I'm like, you're damn right I am, but, you know, carry on. So <laughs> he goes, well, I really love Billy Gardell. And in my head, I'm like, who the hell is Billy Gardell? What the hell has this got to do with me? Uh, so Billy Gardell is the star of Mike and Molly one of Chuck's previous shows. He goes, I love Billy Gardell. 
and I want to work with him again. And I came up with an idea for a show with him as the star where he is, he goes to the hospital having had a heart attack and he falls in love with these Nigerian nurse. So I go, oh, okay. So you want me to be the Nigerian nurse? And Chuck looks at me and goes, not necessarily. <laughs> so, so in my head, I'm like, well, what the fuck am I doing here? Why in my head? Obviously not in the room because I'm not an idiot. And then they were, what we want, you know, we're three white guys. You know, we, we can't write this show with, without a Nigerian or somebody of that heritage. Otherwise, we're going to mess it up. Uh, so that's where you come in. And they start asking me questions about my culture, where I came from, what, you know, what, the, what, you know, just the elements of Nigerian life. And I start to talk to them and I'm throwing in a few jokes and things like that. And once I get in the room with them, I actually like them. <laughs> I actually start to really like these guys. And I'm like, I actually like this Chuck Lorre dude. Uh, and it's the more hours I spent with them, I realized, you know what? They might actually want to make something good. The fact that they brought me in you know, they, you know, Chuck Lorre is the king of sitcoms out here. He's a genius. And the fact that he could see past himself and go, I cannot do this without you. You know, not many people in his position have done that. So we wrote the pilot for this show. And obviously, as a comedian, I'm looking at what we're writing. I'm like, well, I don't want the role of Abishola. I, 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 I look in the mirror every morning. I know I'm no love interest, but I tell you what. I'm going to be, I want to be the funny best friend. That's been my dream since doing starting stand-up is to be the funny best friend on someone else's sitcom, come in, steal the scenes, and then <laughs> use that to sell out comedy clubs and theatres all over the world. So as we started writing the, the pilot, I kept saying to the guys, you know what? She needs a funny friend. She needs a confidant. Don't you think she needs a confidant? And we created this character. She didn't even have a name. She was called Woman on the Bus. Did they know that you were going to be putting yourself forward to play this part? They had no idea. We created <sighs> the character. The pilot gets written. And at the end of it, they, Chuck comes into the room. And he's like, OK, so we've written this pilot. And uh, CBS seems to be interested in it. So if they, do, if they are interested and they pick it up, we're going to start casting. Now, obviously, they'd had discussions. OK, so we've got this Nigerian woman to help us create this pilot. She's obviously going to want the role of Abishola because it's the star role. What are we going to do? Should we let her audition? Like, so Chuck comes into the room with that in his head. And he's like, OK, so this pilot's probably going to get picked up by CBS. And if you want the role of Abishola, you're going to have to audition for it with other actors. We can't just give it to you. And I turned to um, Chuck and I was like, I don't want the role of Abishola. And Chuck and Alan Eddy were like, what? And I, went, I was like, and I pointed to the whiteboard and I was like, I want woman on the bus. <laughs> and Chuck looked at me and went, you are very fucking smart. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. What a brilliant story. Where is that show now in terms of its seasons? Which season are you in? We Where are, are now uh, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going into production to start recording season three. So I'm in the writer's room right now. I'm, I was writing a script literally just before I came on this podcast. And how is your relationship with Chuck Lorre? Great. He respects me. I respect him. Uh, I actually love him a little bit. I mean, he has yeah. changed my entire life. Gina, what, what a delight to catch up with you. And what a delight to, to hear that story of that success and, and the bloody... Going forward, going forward, believing in yourself, truly inspirational. Thank you, Rob. Listen, I've been watching you and watched you create all your own projects. And I was like, that is a guy who knows what he's doing, where he's going. Well, you thought, thought one day that guy will be wearing a flowery shirt and talking to me while I am in Los Angeles <laughs> on my hit show. You said that's what's going to happen. <laughs> Hey, listen, really lovely to catch up with you. Continued success with everything. Congratulations. And thank you for finding the time to do this. No worries, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, Rob. Bye.